He's a retired military chaplain. He'll be doing the service today. Thank you for having him. Okay. <laughs> We're almost 25 years in the service. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Well, thank you. I uh, shared with uh, someone just before the service started here that, uh, you know, Pastor uh, Greg is, you know, I consider him a, a brother in Christ. I worshipped at All Saints Lutheran in Ottawa when he was there. So that's uh, where I, I, you know, first uh, got to know Greg a bit. And uh, now, last year, we moved to Irma here in Alberta. So. Uh, yeah, so I, I gave Pastor Greg a call and came down. We had uh, coffee together, and and he asked if I would uh, be able to come this morning. So here I am. <laughs> so if I lose my place if, at a few points in the service, I'll uh, I'll trust that someone here will give me directions and get me back where I need to be. <laughs> but let us uh, begin with a short word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, on this beautiful Sunday morning, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who has called and gathered us to come together here at Grace Lutheran. As we again focus on Jesus and his love for us, may we be enlightened and may we be empowered to live our lives according to your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us continue by singing our opening hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. <laughs> We begin our service in the name of our holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The word is near you. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Together, let us say the psalm reading, taken from Psalm 27, verses 7 to 14. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O, o God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, 
but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. We continue with our next two uh, selections, In Christ Alone and Lord of All Hopefulness. <laughs> is drought and storm in the depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in <laughs> alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain his gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied sin on him was made here in the death of Christ I live <laughs> there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain and bursting forth in glorious day again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ <laughs> no guilt in life my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand, till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, o Lord, grant us the spirit to hear your word and know the one thing needful that by your word and spirit we may live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Continue with the Old Testament reading. The first reading is from Genesis 18, verses 1 to 10. And the Lord appeared to him by the oak of Manre. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. While I bring a morsel of bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seers of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while he ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door behind him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from Colossians 1, verses 21 to 29. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This is the word of the Lord. again. The Holy Gospel for this day is taken from Luke chapter 10, beginning at the 38th verse. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, 
which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds again be found acceptable in your sight, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When was the last time that you spoke with God? And when was the last time that you listened to hear the voice of God? You know, in any conversation, it's always a good thing if there's about 50-50 airtime. I tried to, uh, you know, get that across to couples, you know, before they're getting married. I don't know how it works out, but I mean, that's, that's just a recommendation. There are people who, uh, like myself, probably talk, take more than that 50, you know, percent of the time, but still good if it goes back and forth. Well, when was the last time that you heard God speak to you? As Lutherans, you know, when it comes to the, the question of where God speaks to us, we are most in, apt to say through his word. And that is certainly correct, whether we understand his word as being the Bible or Jesus Christ, his son. I think, you know, we often overlook just how near to us Jesus is every day and every moment of our lives. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus declares, wherever two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. So we know then, again, you know, we're reminded that Jesus is here with us this morning as we worship here. He's with other Christians wherever they have gathered to worship and share fellowship this morning. He's with us every time. You know, we get together with another Christian and we're having a conversation. But that's not all, is it? For Jesus goes further than that and promises, you know, his presence way beyond any worship service. In Matthew 28, we are reminded of him giving this promise when he said, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, if you're a bit like me, you may not always, you know, have that awareness that Jesus is close by. And when I'm having my Oscar the Grouch moments or complaining and whining, I really don't want to think of Jesus being there, seeing how I'm behaving, or maybe them, some of the words I'm using. But that raises other questions for us as well. You know, if we truly believe that Jesus is, a re you know, resurrected and he is alive, how do you and I live out this truth, this reality? Do you and I dialogue with Jesus? Are we speaking to him? Are we listening for his voice? What kind of a relationship do we have with him? Or for that matter, with God as Father, you know, God as Son, Jesus, God as the Holy Spirit. This morning, we will again experience Holy Communion. And that is exactly what it is. It is holy and it is sacred because God, our Holy Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, comes to serve us, to commune with us. And the basis, you know, of his message is again to remind us of how deeply he loves each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit reveals to us that it is through Jesus' death that all of our sins are forgiven and that thereby God forgives or gives us the sure and certain hope of eternal life. And in this sacrament, we enter into a mystery where God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all present. In the Bible, we see that there are other ways that God speaks to his people as well. 
We have many examples of God speaking through dreams and angels, Daniel, Isaiah, Hagar, Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, the apostles, you know, in the book of Acts, and on and on our list goes. And there are many ac accounts of God speaking to people through angels. And I'm sure some of you here know of stories from within your own social circles of people who have, you know, heard the voice of angels speaking to them. And we would be amiss as well not to recall that rather humorous and unique account of God even speaking through Balaam's donkey in Numbers chapter 22. And perhaps that donkey was one of the first animals to tell others about the secret lives of pets. <laughs> in the Old Testament reading this morning, we heard that God also speaks through other people. And I have had that experience myself where someone has said something and I've sort of taken a little step back and thinking, okay, I don't think that was so much the person speaking as it was, you know, God conveying a message in my direction. This morning our readings do direct our focus to this holy and loving God of ours and his persistent mission to seek us out. God wants to have an intimate spiritual relationship with us to walk with us and talk with us, to laugh with us in the good times, and he's certainly there and weeps with us in those sad times. God wants to enjoy our company, and he wants us to enjoy his company, his love, his protection, his compassion, and all that a relationship with him gives. A relationship that grows during our earthly days and then will continue forever in heaven. It was in holy baptism, of course, that God acted to adopt each one of us of his children. And in, do and in doing so, you know, God has declared that he is delighted and that he is more than, you know, willing to be our God and to have us as his children, members of his family. This de declaration, you know, is of the same essence of, as that which God made to Abraham when he said in Genesis chapter 17, I will, dis I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In our Old Testament reading, we hear the story of how three, and it's always that question of was it men or was it angels or, you know, who were these, you know, people, uh, these ones who came to him? But they come to visit Abraham and Sarah. Regardless of whether these visitors were men or angels in form, you know, the bottom line is that for us as, you know, uh, whether we're Jewish or Christians, we believe that it was God who was in those uh, ones that came to visit Abraham and Sarah. And what a blessing it is that God brings to save Sarah and Abraham, a message of hope, encouragement for them to keep the faith, to persevere, to never give up, and to keep on trusting God in respect to the promise that he gave them some 20 years earlier. The story of Abraham and his developing relationship with God is a delightful one to recall. I'd like us just to quickly sort of do a bit of an overview of that. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 3, we, we hear that God took the initiative, and he first came to Abraham. The section is entitled, The Call of Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And what is Abraham, Ab Abraham's response? Well, it seems that he is somewhat speechless. Nothing is recorded in the Bible as to any verbal reply to God, but there is a response. And in verse 4 we are told, so Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, 
and Lot went with him. And if we were to check chapters 12 and 13, we would find that this pattern continues for many years. God comes to Abraham as he is called in, speaks to him, and Abraham listens. Then he steps out in obedience and faith. The relationship between God and Abraham grows, and they become spiritual intimates. By the time we reach chapter 15, they are in open dialogue, and the Bible records the dialogue in these words. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. And God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And then God said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. And then God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abraham brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know this for certain, that your offspring shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and shall be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your ancestors in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete. Now, isn't that fascinating in many ways? At times, it seems that Abraham spoke rather directly with God. And then there are times when God uh, reveals his message to Abraham by by way of dreams when he's in a deep sleep? Well, can you relate to that? How does God, again, how does he speak to us? There are times when, you know, I speak with God as my Heavenly Father. There are times when I speak with Jesus as my Lord, as my friend, you know, the, that wonderful hymn we have, what a friend we have in Jesus, and we certainly do. Then there are times when I think about being part of God's family, and that means that Jesus is my brother. And, uh, and I speak to him, you know, as a brother. I've got an old, had an older brother. I have, still have a younger brother. So I know what, uh, you know, that brotherly sort of uh, stuff is all about, right? And there are times, of course, when I speak with the Holy Spirit, pray a lot for the Holy Spirit to be with me. And although I admit that these conversations sometimes, you know, I guess maybe somewhat in the nature of prayers, there are also a lot of times, you know, uh, prayers for, for help. And there are times when, uh, yeah, when I get down to whining, right, complaining, whether it's some different aches or pains or whatever it is that I'm not happy about. Can you relate to any of that? Well, there is one other point very important in verses 13 to 16 of that uh, chapter from uh, Genesis. You'll note that God has the future well within his scope of vision. And that's always good for us to know too, that our future in this life and in the life to come has been secured, you know, by Jesus at the cross. 
But in the Genesis text, the point that uh, God tries to, you know, get across is words of hope and encouragement for what is going to come to the people, you know, the Hebrew people. He more or less uh, forewarns, I guess, Abraham about the time of uh, enslavement that will come up in Egypt. In verses 13 and 14, he says, they shall be oppressed for 400 years, but then I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So he prophesies, you know, not only hard times coming, but there will be a day of deliverance. And in verse 15, God again emphasizes this province, promise of deliverance and says, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So in other words, there's different things going on in, you know, different parts of the world that uh, God is very much involved with. So why do I, why do I mention this? <clears throat> well, you and I know that we are living in a post-Christian era. It isn't very cool to be identified you know, as a Christian. We live in a world in which the voice of God seems to have been all but silenced. And in my opinion, our national leaders in North America have little or no fear of God and are totally deaf to the voice of God. Sadly, most so-called Christian churches have also lost their hearing for the voice of God. Of course, there are, you know, spiritual hearing aids that are available upon request. One simply needs to honestly ask God to, to hear his word, <clears throat> hear his word of love and truth, and the Holy Spirit will reveal it. But only those who are truly and honestly willing to seek the Lord will receive that hearing. So then, these words from Genesis chapter 15 do speak, I think, to us as well today. They set before us the challenge to also trust God in, in bringing back, you know, spiritual renewal and revival. And at the same time, we are reminded that God has quite a different perspective where time is concerned. The fulfillment of God's will may require hundreds of years, and we most likely will not see the changes that we would like to in our own time. As a remnant, we will continue to live in a world that embraces darkness instead of life, and that has turned so many things upside down. You know, we still in the church recognize certain types of behavior as sin, and the world that we live in celebrates sin and in the process, of course, turns its back on God and has turned his back on his voice. Isn't it strange that the world now invites us all to celebrate sin during the so-called Pride Month? Gone is all humility and even the common sense that was anchored in the wisdom saying of ages that, de that declares, you know, pride comes before the fall. So the only question that has not been answered is, when will that fall come? Of course, this blindness and darkness, this bondage to sin, is not a new happening within the history of mankind. It clings to us. You know, as scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all get caught up in that, you know, Returning to our story of Abraham and Sarah, you know, uh, the reading leaves off, finishes a little bit early. If we read the next few verses, you know, we would see that uh, when Sarah is reminded of this promise of giving birth to a, ch to a child, that she laughs. And we know that story, right? And God says, you know, why are you laughing? And she says, I didn't laugh. And uh, God says, oh yeah, you did, you did. Well, and I always think, yeah, that fits for us too, doesn't it? You know, we, we kind of are just human as well. 
But in the verses that follow that uh, passage that we have for us today, we get into the story of the very intense emotional dialogue between God and Abraham over the fate of the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. And most of us know that story very well. God's anger reached the boiling point over the sinful lifestyles of the people of these towns. Sodom and Gomorrah were the sin cities of that time. And in verse 20 we hear, Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry has reached me. I want to go, okay, who brought this to God's attention? Well, we don't know. Anyways, Abraham gets the gist of this comment uh, from these uh, ones who have visited him immediately, and he's sort of set back on his heels. And perhaps it is because, you know, his Lot nephew Lot and his family live there that he feels he needs to try and intercede for the lives of the people, or at least for Lot and his family. In verse 23, Abraham pleads, you know, Lord, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in them? Well, God assures Abraham that if there are 50 righteous people, that he will spare the cities. And then the dialogue bounces back and forth. You may recall, well, Abraham says, well, what about 45? What about 40? 30, 20, 10. And each time, you know, God says, no, you know, if there's even that number of righteous people, I will spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, what is the outcome? There weren't even 10 righteous people left in Sodom and Gomorrah. It seems that sin has so consumed them that God has no other choice, but he brings judgment down upon them. And this judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah re reminds us that our God is, yes, he's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And I'm not sure about you, but I find that very comforting when I listen to the news and I hear of all the violence and all of the innocent people. You know, we had that happen again in Calgary. And these people come up through the legal system and they get a little slap on the wrist. And I'm thinking, where is the justice? Well, we have a God who reminds us, you know, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. The justice will come. It will come. That's a guarantee from a God who is both merciful and just. Well, the story of Abraham and Sarah winds down abruptly in chapters 21 and 22, and the last highlight reel from, from that, you know, relationship, that faith story, comes when uh, Abraham is challenged with whether or not to sacrifice his one and only son. And again, the dialogue goes, you know, back and forth, and it's very tense, very emotional. But this time, there's a happy ending. And, God reveals to Abraham that he does not require human sacrifice as a demonstration of love and obedience. And then I look a little more closely there at the Bible, and it's, you know, Abraham lived another 63 years, you know, uh, uh, and the Bible is silent about that relationship. And then I considered my age, and I thought, oh boy. Does that mean now that as I head into the twilight years, it's going to be kind of more subdued in terms of that relationship? <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. Uh, you and I know people who are in their 90s and still have a very active and, I think, dynamic dialogue going on with, with God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But that is where I think our uh, readings for this morning, you know, take us. In the story of Mary and Martha, again, we have a story of an incarnate God. God was in Jesus, and it's, you know, it's just a delightful story, right? You know, God finds this, uh, these two sisters and a brother, and he, he has this wonderful relationship with them, and he comes to visit them, and. And I don't know how much Mary and Martha were looking beyond, you know, this life. Jesus was. And he was very much, you know, uh, nurturing that relationship along. And I'm sure he was delighting in, you know, just uh, how that would carry on 
you know, after they were all in, in heaven uh, together. But he takes, you know, uh, just an everyday example again with Martha being uh, distracted by serving, you know. I, I, uh, and as, as Lutherans, I'm not sure about you, they say most of us as much as 99% would, would uh, identify with Martha. Uh, we tend to be uh, sort of eager beavers and always jumping up to do things. Uh, but anyways, uh, the bottom line there is that Jesus comes to their house. He comes to your house. He comes to my house. And he wants us to take the time to slow down and to listen. Listen for his voice. And if that means opening the Bible and reading, well, we need to open up the Bible and reading. He speaks to us through dreams. Perhaps he has a message where, like Abraham, we need to just simply step out in faith and, and obey. And it would be wonderful if we had uh, more time this morning to listen to, you know, your stories. I have stories I could share about our encounters, you know, with Jesus. And say, so in a moment again, we will celebrate Holy Communion. And for our heritage as, as Lutherans, you know, and you've probably been taught that too, and I always find it a bit unnerving because I was told, you know, when we get down to the words of institution, <clears throat> this is my body given for you, that uh, at that point, we understand it as though Jesus is speaking through the lips of the person saying those words. And so in that sense, it's a wonderful mystery where, uh, yeah, Jesus is still speaking and he still invites us to share in, in fellowship uh, with him and uh, just embraces us in his love so that we can go on living, trying to live according to his will all the days of our life. How blessed we are that Jesus honors us with his presence, literally, every moment of our lives. Amen. <clears throat>
keep you in eternal life. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. Mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus be with you always. Amen. Let us now share the peace of the Lord with one another. Peace of Jesus be with you. The 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 peace of Christ be with you. Let us continue by receiving the offering. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, all that we are and all that we have, we have received as, you know, gifts and blessings from you. We pray now that you would accept these offerings as expressions of our gratitude. And we pray that they would be used to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated for the prayers. I will end each uh, petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy. And we would ask for you to uh, respond with the words, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you know, the many blessings that we do enjoy, food, shelter, family, friends, employment. But most of all, we thank you again for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through whom we have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We remember again this day all who are in need, the homeless, the hungry, the unemployed. We remember too those who are suffering emotionally, physically, spiritually, those in hospitals, care homes, prisons, or even in their own homes. Lord, in your mercy, <clears throat> we lift up to you all those who are grieving uh, the death of a loved one this day. We especially remember in our prayers today the uh, many victims of the tragedy in Nice and France, of the uh, police uh, 
uh, you know, officers that were killed in Dallas and Texas. You remember the families and friends of the, the young mother and daughter killed in Calgary. For all those in mourning this day, and for those to whom death draws near, near, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, it seems that there is so much darkness and despair in our world. There is too much violence, too much senseless killing and persecution. We pray that the light of Christ might dispel darkness and bring the dawning of a new day to the troubled and oppressed people and in our nations and in other nations of this planet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, Lord, that you would be with your church on earth and empower your people to speak your word of truth, that lives may be transformed and the unrepentant may turn and worship you, the one true God. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for your blessings upon this congregation, upon Pastor Greg and his family. Be with each person here today. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, too, that you would be with Zach Quinlan and Chelsea Eichel as they prepare for their wedding next Saturday. We pray that, uh, you know, all married persons would uphold you know, your example of the basic, uh, you know, institution for all of society. Lord, in your mercy. continue then with the words of institution. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We say together then the prayer that our Lord Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We say together the uh, communion celebration at this time, do we? The same love of God? Yeah, yes.
That's good. I can put that way. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for coming to us through the celebration of this holy sacrament. May we indeed be reminded of your love that you have for each one of us, a love that has been shown so strongly through Jesus Christ, your Son. And may we therefore be stirred by your Holy Spirit to respond in loving service to those that we share our lives with this day. We pray through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Receive the benediction. And now may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us forever. Amen. Please be seated. This time we uh, will have the announcements. <clears throat> Daryl's not here, so in my good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Daryl. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's hearing us wherever he is. Um, first announcement. Um, video Bible study on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. Take part in the adventure of disciplinary. Discipleship, sorry. Well, you can be disciplined too at Bible study, I guess. Um, or two, come on down to the wedding shower for Zach and Chelsea. Uh, today at the worship, after the worship service, there's plenty of food and good company downstairs. Uh, Pastor Greg returns from his holiday on Wednesday the 20th of July. Please keep Pastor Greg and Chris and his family in your prayers, please. Um, on Tuesday movie night in the parish hall, this week is the master designer. Uh, look at the wonders of creation. And the Discover Your Spirit Gifts, the Spiritual Gifts Leadership Team is meeting this Tuesday at the 19th at 10.30 a.m. in the parish hall. And healing prayer service is this Wednesday night at 7. Do you have something to say on that, Ken? Did you want to say it, or is that? Okay, and that's it. I got for announcements. Oh, um, oh yes. Uh, VBS sign-up sheets are at the back. Um, there has been some activity on that. Please uh, take time to read where you can serve in regards to volunteers or food, which is really important, especially cookies, chocolate chip. Um, other than that, uh, I don't have anything else. Ken. Hello folks, so uh, it was a very interesting Friday evening. We went to the Bob Larson Exorcist uh, uh, seminar there. Um, some of the people thought we were getting home early, but we got home roughly about one o'clock in the morning. Okay, so um, it was very interesting. The uh, one fellow that was possessed, he knew he was possessed, he came over and asked for help. And uh, the pastor uh, uh, got, it, got it exposed by prayer. And then when he started to twitch and move and this and that, they brought him up to the front. He was just a small little black guy. He might be 120 pounds. It took five people to hold him still. He was shaking and convulsing and everything else. And uh, which shows the reality that not only does God exist, but Satan does, and he's around, okay? And I'm sure glad that our church is in the healing and deliverance ministry, because there, for the people that were there, we had about a dozen of us that were there, saw the reality of the, the evil side. But also be understand that in Jesus' name, 
the demon was kicked out. The demon was, the name of it was Python spirit. And he was from Africa, it comes from that area of the world, okay? So be aware that these things are there and the reality uh, of them are there, but also this re-verifies the power of God. It is through God and through the authority of Jesus Christ that he was delivered. Okay. So it was very interesting. Uh, quite a few people with their eyes wide open when that was happening. So. so be aware of that. It is true. And we are definitely heading in the right direction for our church. And with all the evil, like the pastors are saying, that's going around this world, Satan is involved in it. And, and through prayer from all of us, because of the Holy Spirit in us, we can suppress it and fight back. So do believe your prayers do work, okay? And don't forget, this Wednesday is healing. So if you have any friends that need to come over for a prayer, whatever the ailment is, or just, they feel just not even focused, send them down, come on down, and we'll give them a prayer, okay? Please rise, let us uh, sing our closing hymn. Salvation in our hearts and